Hello everyone. <clears throat> I want to reconstruct the frowns of my grandfather. That was the word those were the words of Pierre de Gaulle, Monsieur Pierre de Gaulle, the grandson of General de Gaulle. There's an interview with him that I'm going to share with you. Um, in the previous video, uh, uh, about an interview with uh, the great grandson of Tolstoy in Russia, now in the Duma Parliament of Russia. <coughs> I said in passing that I thought that the uh, the French are still able to a great extent to speak more freely in questions of politics and geopolitics and what is happening in the world much more, it seems to me, much more freely than we can hear in Great Britain. Uh, there seem to be more openness to different voices. This is just an opinion of mine. But in any way, uh, anyway, um, I have found this interview today that I'm going to share with you. It's something different from yesterday's, but it, it's um, in, in many, in, in very many ways, somewhat similar. What I'm going to tell you at the very beginning is his general uh, take on politics is that he's very much pro the sovereignty of each nation state, even within Europe. He, refer he never uses, nevertheless, he never uses the word the collective West. I think this is on purpose. He never uses it. He refers independently to the United States of America or to the Americans and to the European Union or the European nations. But he uses one term that caught my, my interest, my, yeah, because he says the Anglo-Saxon world. I thought that this was interesting because I think he's trying to make a point of both the United States and Great Britain and Australia and New Zealand and Canada and so on being perhaps on one side and I think this is what he, he, he thinks, drawing the whole of the world, certainly drawing Europe into the same policies. And I think, like his grandfather, is going to disagree with that. He just, uh, you make up your mind, but uh, he, he, he continuously uses this term, the Anglo-Saxon world, or the Anglo-Saxon philosophy, or the Anglo-Saxon way of doing things. So listen to it. I think you'll find it interesting. I'm going to share with you only, uh, I got as far as half of it, if, if, if that. Um, I'll probably, if I feel like it, I'll do the rest tomorrow, if you enjoy it anyway. Okay, so, um, uh, is, uh, um, okay, so it's an interview conducted in French with General de Gaulle's grandson, Pierre de Gaulle. He'll talk about politics, about geopolitics, about France's domestic policies, to be sure, about Macron, who President Macron, who um, gave a speech about five days ago uh, as he renewed his government, about, as I said, what he calls the Anglo-Saxon overall influence in the world today. And uh, so I've picked out a few of his comments. Um, first, he's going to talk uh, very generally, he's going to give his reaction, he's asked about it, a reaction to President Macron's uh, lengthy speech about five days ago. Um, so, he says, by the way, he looks like General de Gaulle, he, he, the grandson, but he looks almost exactly like him, like him, and although he's sitting down, I have the overall impression that he is just as tall as he is, I don't know, but he looks very much like him. Anyway, he starts like this. What struck me about Macron's speech was the attitude of Emmanuel Macron. He was, let us say, particularly tense. His body language 
so to say, escape no one's attention. He tried to justify a renewal, a momentum for France, which is subject to a deep social divide at the moment and a deep in a deep economic crisis, trying to give a sort of dynamic young image with a prime minister who we could call is his mini-me, <laughs> who is extremely young, who has no international base whatsoever, a real dimension uh, to be able to lead a government uh, he, he, he won't be able to lead a government, let alone a country. He's someone who will be just ob very obedient in what he will be asked to do. But has certainly not, in my opinion, the momentum, the strength, the conviction or the program that France currently needs in relation to today's crisis, and especially on the international scene. The fact is that to make announcements with a lot of emphasis, lots of verbiage, this is practically, uh, are practically very basic measures. There is really nothing of sus substance there, just words, nothing solid. He refers to national education, he talked about it, how we are trying to, uh, he said we are trying to bring back the school uniform to strengthen educational programs, going to strengthen, I would say, the, he, uh, the controls over exams. This is nowhere near enough for a society that is falling apart at the seams. This is not serious. He also spoke of our uh, weakness, our fragility. He recognized the weakness of France and its economic situation with regard to our industrial capacity. But the measures he gives do not respond to small and medium-sized businesses. The measures he talked about amounted to about 50,000 businesses uh, there is a very sharp increase. I, I didn't quite follow this. The failure is the failure of businesses, uh, small and medium-sized businesses, is between fifty and sixty percent in France, depending on the size of the company. The state is actually the main employer. I think the French people are seeing it now. They understand it well. And, but he appointed a prime minister who is 34 years old to lead the country's politics. I find it extremely risky, reckless. We cannot entrust the republic to kids. It takes years and years of experience to lead a country. You need mental solidity. You even need faith. The members of the government do not have, in my, my opinion, any faith at all. And seeing that one needs convictions, you need a real plan. We cannot go around moving from one side to the other side, from one circumstance to another, depending uh, on whatever. It is not serious. And to answer your question, the feeling vis-a-vis -vis foreign countries, France is constantly going down, he says, descending on the international scene. We have become the laughing stock of the world. President Macron uh, then talks about national policies, nuclear energy, ex electricity, etc. He also, then he goes on about these very uh, defined, clearly defined uh, um, policies, uh, national policies in France. And, but then he comes to the European Union. He is very critical of U, uh, the European Union directives. He says, European law imposes itself. It is above national law. It is destroying our republic, the sovereignty of the nation. Not only does the EU directives, uh, not only are they above national law, but 
moreover, the threshold now has been raised. So, for example, by 2030, 42.5% they have directed, ordered, has to be renewable energy. These are extreme measures. Russian exports of liquefied natural gas in particular, the price has increased 40% since the war. Certain countries are extremely dependent, in, particularly, uh, in particular Spain, which is the second largest importer, but France also. Costs have increased. This has to be dealt with. Big announcements are not enough. In other words, he's just saying words, 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 you know, like the Italians say, parole, 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 parole. <laughs> Big announcements are not enough. But we are subject to EU directives which aim to destroy French sovereignty and French independence. So obviously, the president yesterday was careful not to talk about it. He just said, yes, of course, we objected to the 10% increase on the price of electricity. But, you know, the cost of elect electricity in France is lower than in other countries. So this is Macron speaking, so perhaps it's all right. And he continues, he cited, he cited two examples, Italy and Germany which are obviously in a situation of extreme, utter dependency, in particular Germany, who, uh, which due to the effect of the sanctions against Russia, they, you see, they imported Russian gas at very, very low prices. And now it is obliged to having to import liquefied natural gas, gas much still from Russia, for sure, but now has to go through terminals, through the Baltic Sea, many other places, and that completely, I would say, destroy the competitiveness of its industry. He then talks about wind power. He mentions the Anglo-Saxon lobby with the ecological lobby in Germany, which destroyed the nuclear power plants in the 1980s and 90s. So now what you have is industries which are very much dependent on energy supplies, which have seen their production fall by 11% last year, after a 10% decline the year before. And that created social fractures, unemployment, etc. Germany is in a recession. We put uh, we put them we put ourselves in a situation of they put themselves in a situation of deep dependence. Obviously, all these ecological standards, these diversity standards, these energy transitions are not enforced. However, in the U.S which, of course, it is now selling us much more expensive gas. The interviewer, a nice young lady, uh, says to him, you spoke about the Anglo-Saxon lobby who forced Germany, together with the German ecological lobby. Um, it is also very visible in France to impose on us this ecological transition. Uh, for example, wind power and so on, which is gradually destroying our energy sovereignty. But you kind of added an additional piece to the, chase, to the chessboard here when you said that the German lobby itself comes from the Anglo-Saxon uh, Anglo lobby, or they are working together at any rate. And he responds, exactly. The Germans, I would say, suffered a takeover from 1945. From a strategic point of view, Germany, in, uh, in my opinion, does not represent a danger, but it has been controlled, I would say absorbed, into what I call it a federalist Europe. Not a Europe of nations, but a federalist enterprise. Its capacity for emancipation is absolutely controlled. 
Some of the listeners may not be aware that Madame Ursula von der Leyen uh, is a protege, a child of, uh, the American services. I don't know what he means by American services, establishment perhaps. Um, as her family, he says, had been threatened to be taken hostage in the 1980s. I seem to remember that. She comes from an industrial, very powerful industrial family, and a far-left German group had threatened to take family hostage. Her successive declarations go perfectly in tandem with, I would say, complete submission to Anglo-Saxon interest. Again, it's uh, Anglo-Saxon, uh, not American, not collective West. Question. And the explosion of the gas pipelines, which have ended up preventing any cooperation between Germany and Russia, came from these same Anglo-Saxon lobbies? Yes, he says. Donald Trump, who is re-emerging in a credible way as a possible future president, said at the time when he was president that while he was uh, alive in his lifetime, there would be no North Stream. I don't know whether this is me talking. I don't know whether President Trump was fully aware of things, so whether he was in international politics. He's obviously a good businessman and so on. But when it came to geopolitics, I, I you know, many have suggested that he was being manipulated, that they would put it in a way to him that he didn't quite understand. He doesn't think historically, he doesn't think philosophically. But in any, that's, that's my own thought. But uh, okay, so um, while uh, that in his lifetime, there would be no, at least when he was president, I suppose, there would be no North Stream. Uh, the Nord Stream, anyway, the second gas pipeline, which had, uh, which had ensured a supply of 50 billion something to Europe, therefore long-term contracts at guaranteed lo lo low prices for, in the, entire, for the, the whole of Europe. That was the Nord Stream, what the Nord Stream pipeline was doing. Ultimately, the question is, Energy independence and the industrial and structural independence of Europe, well, the US have done everything to ensure that Europe cannot ally itself with Russia, which would have made it a power, I would say, an independent and an autonomous power. Russia being by the immensity of its territory and all the resources at its disposal, it is Russia is perfectly autonomous, which is absolutely not the case with Europe. So, we substituted a supply, a cheap supply, with for an Anglo-Saxon dependence on other supplies at extremely high cost, and this destroys our industries. I think it's a process which is systematic, systematically decided and well organized to absorb, align, and I would say, I would say align with uh, American diplomacy. Let me put it this way, a Pax Americana, that is to say a block, an entity, where either you are in perfect compliance with them, and in accordance with American policies, or you are excluded, condemned, sanctioned. American diplomacy is a diplomacy based on sanctions. The dollar has become a currency in order to a, a currency to sanction others. I have to say I have nothing against the Americans. This is now the politician speaking. I have nothing against the Americans. It is just an imperialist, poli is, is 
it is just an imperialist policy of control and of limiting the emancipation of peoples, a destruction of the meaning of the nation-state, that is what I thoroughly denounce. Let me tell you, I've worked, I've worked myself for American enterprises, American banks. They follow a culture of efficiency, which is absolutely remarkable. Simply, they are people who carry out very precise, very comprehensive studies, but who always, nevertheless, act in the short term. But of course, Americans act always, always, he says, in their own interests. Our president Mitterrand, Mitterrand was the president of France between 1981 and 1995. Uh, uh, our president Mitterrand had already denounced this during the interviews he gave at the end of his life. That Americans, he said, were always engaged in a, quote, ruthless and merciless war. It is an ongoing war, an economic political and diplomatic war that we are now facing too. The circumstances have changed. Right now, this American monopoly is ceasing to exist. I think one of the outcomes of the war in the Ukraine is that, that we can draw is that we are now at the end of a myth, which is the myth of supremacy of technological, political, and economic, also, supremacy of the Western world. The interviewer says, There is a book by Emmanuel Todd, your views seem to resemble his, who has just released a book about the defeat of the West, where, where he points out that if Europe ultimately were to get the US off its back, that would be the best thing that could happen to Europe. And uh, Monsieur de Gaulle says, well, no, uh, I am not for this exclusion. Europe cannot get rid of the United States. The, U the United States is a partner, it's a commercial partner. It is a completely credible partner with whom we must have exchanges. It is a country that has helped liberate France from the occupier, which in turn tends to make people believe that it was at the same time the Anglo-Saxons only who helped to liberate France, which this is not the case. In 1944, French troops numbered 700,000, 700,000 strong, and 150 1,500,000, I'm confusing my figures, at the time of the liberation. Thanks to some of our former colonies, which paid a heavy price. But of course, one must not forget Russia. I think that without the victory of Stalingrad, it would have been very difficult. And without the power of the Russian victory, it would have been extremely difficult, extremely difficult, to break the military power of, of the Nazi occupation at the time. We tend to forget who the victors were, as we tend to forget also France Libre and their contribution. But the Americans are our allies. They are our natural allies. They are economic partners. I don't know partners, partners, but <laughs> the new logic of the world, and particularly in the case of the multipolar world and the BRICS, is that we are no longer in a log logic, he says, of one block, nor in a binary one. But we are now in a multipolar world where one might be free to choose its partners according to its each country's securities guarantees, economic outlets, diversification. This is the logic of this new world. Those who are against this, 
uh, who are against this one unipolar model call it uh, the global south or whatever or whatever the global south these are countries that want to develop freely and independently and they want to retain their identity it is a fundamental value I think what makes the identity of a people is precisely respect for its culture and its identity. It is a new way of development, this one, expanding. It is expanding now, reinforced by this war in the Ukraine, since it has caused extremely strong alliances, in particular Russia and China, now very solid allies with trade which has increased very sharply and immen uh, an increase of 50% in the last year uh, we are at we are we are no 250 uh, i don't read my notes uh, 250,000 billion dollars between russia and china also with india 50 billion and therefore, this has created a crystallization of countries which have allied themselves in a group to defend their own interests and participate in a global dynamic, regrouping themselves, which creates also a dynamic for new diplomatic spaces, which creates also rapprochement in particular, in particular, the enlargement of the BRICS this year. The original countries of Brazil, Russia, China, South Africa, India, uh, which were emerging economies in the 1990s, they are dominant economies now. And more countries are joining now. Saudi Arabia, the United Arab Emirates, Egypt, Ethiopia, Iran, they're all joining. Note that these countries are 80% of the oil route and route, sorry, and 60% of raw materials, including agricultural raw materials. It is an extremely strong dynamic. You know that uh, I travel to international conferences all the time. And I was recently in Dubai and in Abu Dhabi, and I am off, I am often abroad, and I can see, I can sense, I can tell you that this is a very, very strong dynamic, he says, uh, going on here. Question, is this something we don't see or we refuse to see? We refuse to see it. The African countries are very much coming into their own. The Arab countries, they are coming together. Indonesia, China, South American countries, these countries want respect. They want to keep their own fundamental values, their traditional values. It is not just economics. They want to keep the traditional family identity and also develop independently, distinctly, with no one coming to tell them what to do, what to think, and especially set themselves away. For, and especially they want to set themselves away from the dollar. They have realized that either you are aligned to the U.S. or you are sanctioned. Um, quite simply, the Americans can block payment systems in dollars, so there is a fall, a fracture in the legal system. More, an American legal system is imposed in most Western countries, and certain other country and, and other countries in the world without any reciprocity. Look, when you open an account. You must give authorization to your bank. This is also the case with life insurance companies, insurance contracts, etc. To disclose the information upon simply a request from American tax authorities, 
even if there is no indication whatsoever of you being American or an American resident or subject to anything to do with America. And this is done in a completely unilateral way. What happens here is that there is a, or there has been a takeover, I would say. There has been a takeover of our legal system. Therefore, it is American law which imposes itself on our countries. And not only that, at the same time, we have also European Union law imposing itself as well, superseding national law. This is extremely serious. I would also like to note that President Macron yesterday, he referred several times to the internet and the need to control the use of screening with possible bans in, uh, banning in particular uh, to do with children. Well, this is to announce the fact that information will be controlled and sanctioned. Of course, they will use the issue of children to do it. If you don't agree with their own thinking, uh, you will be banned. This has gone completely unnoticed. Well, the media did not cover it or perhaps gave it the usual spin. Have, people haven't noticed the announcement by Ursula von der Leyen last week, the president of the European Com uh, Commission in Davos, to introduce the Digital Service Act, that is a sort of Ministry of Truth with regard to information uh, and things to do with the Internet. And she said that it was to ensure that European values, she's always going on about, about this chestnut of European values. This was to ensure that European values are respected and therefore that any person, entity or organization who do not respect European values could be sanctioned. I think European values, what she means is woke values, if you are against uh, woke values, um, you're going to be in trouble. Uh, they have as a matter of fact, spent quite a quite a great deal. This is me talking. <laughs> uh, quite a great deal of effort, perhaps since the presidency of Obama, to introduce this woke culture, little by little. Hence, divide the the citizens. Anyway, to implement it. Okay, sorry, Monsieur de Gaulle. Okay, he continues. This is a fundamental attack on the freedom of information. The French people have not been informed, probably. On the 22nd of November of last year, the European Parliament passed a law which considerably broadens the scope of application of the European directives even more, which will be extended also to the field of education, to the field of freedom of expression, to the field of property, holding property itself. And I think we are entering into a truly, a truly worrying period of loss of fundamental freedoms, not only in France, but in all European countries, which provoke, I would call it, a natural reflex to defend one's nations. Nationalism, for me, is a legitimate expression of a return to the values of our republic in the case of France, and the identity of the country. This is emerging now everywhere in Europe. It will deepen uh, perhaps the social divide. The interviewer says about this divide, for example, the Davos Forum where 
let us say, the grandees of the globalist grandees gathered uh, and talk, uh, they talked this time about disinformation, misinformation. I dealt with that yesterday, you remember? Um, disinformation, misinformation in order, they said, to, quote, rebuild trust and uh, am, am, amidst all this, don't understand. Okay, it was Ursula von der Leyen that explained that Russia has lost the war in Ukraine. Well, I'd say, this is the interview, I said, if you're talking about this war of disinformation and misinformation, Russia certainly lost it. The West certainly won that one. But never mind. This shows, she says, clearly the gap between the globalist, globalist elite and the reality of things on the ground, Monsieur de Gaulle. He says, yes, of course, a desire to manipulate public opinion while sl uh, slipping in a few realities at the same time. Little by little, we are being engaged in a process of preparing public opinion and world opinion, in fact, for the defeat of NATO in the Ukraine, defeated by Russia. Well, Parisians last year elected Putin Man of the Year, the Grand Strategist of the Year. The Wall Street Journal in the United States did the same thing. The reality on the ground is that Europe absolutely does not have the means to continue the war in Ukraine, and even less the US. They have refused uh, an extension of credits and made it clear that there were no more funds available for Ukraine. So, as usual, now they are leaving Europe to continue alone, to continue to finance this war, and Van der Leyen will say yes, of course, <laughs> uh, but this war, which is already lost due to lack of means, lack of military means, lack of financial means, lack of troops, it is a fratricidal war between the Slavic people that even the European Union, no, sorry, that even the Ukrainians no longer want to continue. The stakes of this war it has been debated, debated long enough. I've spoken about it everywhere. It is a conflict widely used, it has been used, to weaken Europe, to disunite Europe, and make it dependent on the... On, to, to disunite Europe, to divide Europe, and make it dependent on the United States a pretext created, if you wish, to expand NATO to the East. We all know by now all about how Russia was promised it would never happen, not an inch to the East, said the Americans, and then they turn around and started doing so in the 1990s under Bill Clinton. Each new country that joins NATO must spend 2000 2% of their GDP on arms expenditure. Recently, the British minister, forgot his name, said, <laughs> I forgot his name, he's being a, a, a diplomat, he's being a Talleyrand here. Talleyrand, uh, you know, the diplomat, uh, socialized um, politician of the 18th century. Okay, he says, recently the British Prime Minister, I forgot his name, said that we have to increase the spending effort to 2.5%. Obviously, we have to buy American weapons. What we did in Ukraine to fuel the, bid the bidding war is to give our arms stocks to Europe, the arms, the arms stocks, the weapons stocks now are empty. We sent old, we sent old 
obsolete weapons without any real impact, strategic or milita military impact. And these stocks must now be refilled again, obviously at an extremely high cost each time. When a defense missile is used, used it costs about two million dollars. On the other side, Russia is sending drones which cost much less. The reports are clearly, clearly in favor of Russia in industrial capacity, in man count, in war effort, and in the mentality, the mental disposition for war. I said we have lied to the Ukrainians by saying that Putin's regime was going to collapse, that we would make it collapse, that it would collapse on its own, and above all, that we could change it from the outside. And I think that we really have to become aware of Russians' mentality, how the Russians think. You know that I used to go to Russia often, and I think we made the serious mistake of looking at this conflict, conflict looking and looking at other countries with always with Western eyes. The Russians are perfectly aware that President Putin saved the country from ruin after the collapse of the Soviet Union. The country had collapsed. The oligarchs, a few people robbed and plundered the country, transferred the assets of the country to their bank accounts. Uh, yes, but this was just the icing on the cake. America was there plundering, plundering it too. Um, but they didn't touch the nuclear system. But everything else was taken, even even documents, uh, which are all kinds of documents, historical documents, which are now in all the university lab libraries in the United States. But anyway, okay. Again, pardon, Monsieur, Monsieur de Gaulle. Um, they they planted planted the country. They did plunder the industrial resources, financial resources of the country, and all of it, leaving for the all and all of it was uh, leaving for the U.S., Israel, and London. And Putin stopped it, restored little by little a renewed pride of this great country. It's a great nation. It's a strong nation. They suffered as much or more than most. Strong. And I am going to quote some figures, lest anybody listening start saying I am blindly pro-Russian. But the reality is that Russia will have a growth rate higher than 4% this year. An industrial growth rate above 6% with a balance of payments only limited to 1%. And when you hear Bruno Le Maire say in 2022 that he was going to bring the Russian economy down to its knees, and now the Chinese economy down also down to its knees, this is a lie. It is a manipulation. And therefore, and therefore since it is a manipulation, it is also an admission of powerlessness. This is as far as I got. He goes into uh, greater details. I, th I think I, um, I, I will do the rest tomorrow. Um, what do you think? Um, he um, actually, he admits at the end of the interview, he's asked if he's going to run for president. And he says, yes. Yes, he's going to do it. Um, he he was he has always been sort of uh, either a diplomat or uh, he he worked in banks as he said, but uh, not involved actively involved in politics. But I think he says he's going to have a go at it. So it, this is this is a, 
this is important because if he is and he starts talking in Europe about not following the Anglo-Saxon axis as it were you know sort of making Europe see themselves as a different entity this could change things this is important this man is important anyway he is the grandson of President de Gaulle but you know President de Gaulle where are all those great people you know the Churchills the Roosevelt's the Kennedys and prefer well Kennedy yeah you know that that uh, that speech at American University where he's basically saying that the United States that there was a state within a state that the United States had been practically captured by transnational financial forces and so on it's quite an amazing speech actually so he actually he saw what was happening he was uh, dead at like two months after that um, where are all these men we need men like this because now our politicians are all they sound the same they, you know they're just like like uh, you know cut out from the same cookie cutter uh, they sound the same they say the same words they even look the same uh, Trudeau Macron Santos in, in Spain uh, ah. Ah. <laughs> I'll see you tomorrow Bye-bye.